Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Then she goes up and she smacks this uh, gentleman on the uh, on the uh, tushy. Tukas. And he turns around and it turns out it's her boss. <laughs> Hashtag her boss. Right? And then turns around again and who's over there? But her boyfriend. Hashtag boyfriend. Uh, wearing, wearing the same outfit. So uh, it's see. a case of mistaken identity. So you're brought into this love triangle. And then... What it what happens is it that we do a close up on her, looking at him, 
looking back at the other him, and the voiceover says, stress sweat smells the worst. My question to you, once again, does stress sweat really smell worse than regular sweats? I feel like that's a stress, a stretch. I'm, I'm sticking with yes. Because <laughs> I tell you, my stress sweat really smells right now. You're stressing me out, man. <laughs> Uh, you're you're blaming me. Look at that. Do you feel that? that was I think I I think the Hell's Angels just came by. Was that? I, I am stress sweating now. Doing your other job while we're recording, huh? Picking up garbage. I, <laughs> that Take those two things are unrelated. <laughs> um, how you doing, Andrew? Are you ready for my question? Yeah. Oh yeah, you had one too. Let's go. This is just this is just interesting. Okay, do the names. Laser Meyer, Wilhelm Fried, Schmuel Geldfitz, or, well, do any of those names mean anything to you? <laughs> um, Laser Meyer, Wilhelm Fried, and Schmuel Geldfitz. Well, well Schmuel <laughs> Geldfit, I, the, well, Gel- Geldfitz. I, Gelb- yeah. Geldfitz? Geldfitz? Gelb? Schmuel Gelbfitz. Like F-I-T-Z or F-I-S-Z? Is it the the Polish? G-E-L-B-F-I-S-Z. So, what? So, that would be uh, the the Gelb... That's... Schmuel (laughs) Gelbfish was uh, Sam Goldwyn. Correct. Schmuel Gelbfitz was Sam Goldwyn. Okay. The other one, what, William Fried, was that the Wilhelm Fried? Was Wilhelm. that the? Was, was he anyway related to the Wilhelm scream? No, he was not. <laughs> okay, but I'm trying to stay in in the genre. <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, okay, you're so, Wikipediaing well. <laughs> no, 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 I did not Wikipedia. Uh, I did not uh, Wikipedia that one. Actually, uh, it, the reason I know Geldfish, kind of, shall I tell you? Why you yeah. you tried to trump me, but I know that I, one. I did, and you, yeah, yeah. go. Because uh, Sam Goldwyn uh, Jr. Uh, was a speaker at my high school. Oh, there you go. Yeah, so I had to do research and show them all around. Oh, look at you! So I did research, yeah, so- and that took me it took me back about twenty five years. <laughs> Flashback. Uh, oh, yes. So. Now, you tell tell me who was the so first Bill, one again? Bill, Give me the first La- one again. Laser Meyer. Laser Meyer, and I assume that's not spelled L A S E R. L A Z A R. Sorry. Okay, I'm. I now I'm. Now I'm Wikipedia. <laughs> now, you're Wikipedia now I'm officially yes. Wikipedia, that, and that, that I don't know. I'll just, just tell you that would be Louis B. Mayer. Oh, okay, okay. So then, then Wilhelm. F- Wilhelm Fried. Wilhelm Fried is going to be William. William. Fox. Fox. I From see. Now I knew that. The Fox. <laughs> century Fox. <laughs> well, Helm Fox. Just interesting little. Uh, you what, know, where did this come from for you? What, 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 this is a I, grueling. I, this is a grueling line of inquiry. It really was. It really was. I'm reading the uh, one of the plethora of uh, biographies of Joseph P. Kennedy. And it's about his Hollywood oh. years specifically, and and how he ruled the roost when he was uh, the, uh, working there. And they mentioned these names, and I'm like, gosh, those are the strangest names for people who were like these big movie moguls running the studios. And uh, you know, it's just it was it was an interesting time in our uh, history where people were changing their names to to something that was easier because you wouldn't call MGM which is Metro Goldwyn Mayer, you wouldn't want to call it Metro Gelfitzmeyer. <laughs> or instead of 20th Century Fro- Fox, 20th Century Freed. You know, <laughs> it doesn't work as well. Uh, that's awesome. No, it so, doesn't. That was good. So what do you have a do you have a uh, do you have a story about name change in your family at all? I not that I'm aware of. I got I got one. It's, it's sort of it's it, it's a little bit silly. It's uh, oh, really? yeah. No, they added they added an S to my on my my maternal line um, on uh, some at entering the the country. There was this 
the German name, uh, uh, family name, was Peter. You know, mm. And so they added an S to make to anglicize it, make it Peters. And uh, so now, you know, luckily, you know, my mom married and took the name right because I, otherwise I'd be Peter Peters. And that would just, that would just be, that would be <laughs> a little repetitively redundant. Right, right. Yes. I'd probably be on Broadway now. Yeah. Man. I should change my name. You should. Peter Peters. Sometimes, sometimes all it takes is a good name change. Somebody Ooh, wouldn't <laughs> career takes off. <laughs> Take a fat thirty seconds for it to become Peter's Peter. <laughs> Please. Okay. Oh my. Uh, shall we? Let, you know what? This is the next reel. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm Pete Wright. That's uh, Andy Nelson over there. You can find us individually. You should find us at Pete Wright on Twitter, at Soda Creek Film on Twitter. Uh, that's where you find us. And we, we would love to connect with you. Please please join us there. We also have these other properties, as they say online. You go to thenextreel.com. You can find out more about this show. You can find out all of our, you can listen to all of our past shows. You can subscribe to the show, which will take you to iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. So you never miss a single episode of Next Real Goodness. Uh, and let's see, you can find us on Facebook for the continuing conversation and excellent links. Uh, at I would say essentially uh, administered with the firm but gentle hand of uh, your friend and mine, Steve Sarmento, mm -hmm. who, who really tells us what to do and when to do it. That's really what has happened. <laughs> we, we ask him, we ask him as, a, as a favor and lover of film, and he has officially, made, well, he's made himself right at home in all of the best ways. Yes. And he's also our uh, lead blogger. He is. God, he's got some great posts. Yeah, I like his uh, Star Wars one that he just put up. I know. <laughs> Two gold men swatting each other with lightsabers. <laughs> it does make you stop and reflect back. It sure does. <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you this. I just, our movie tonight, because uh, my wife's out of town, and so, you know, that becomes movie night. And uh, so we, uh, today, uh, we're recording this on a Tuesday, or a little bit early. Uh, today, uh, Star Trek uh, Into Darkness hit. Uh, on mm -hmm. iTunes, and so of course we picked it up right away and watched it with my kids. And you know what? They they love that movie. They love that movie. Have they seen the Star Trek Wrath of Khan? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes, they have, and uh, and they are they are Trekkies of the next generation. I mean, this generation. Not, <laughs> man, they messed that up. <laughs> yeah, that was that was good. Yeah, you could have gone somewhere know. with that. Though. I know, you really, really could have. Really could have. But uh, you know, uh, there, yeah, and we're we're working through Star Trek Enterprise, the series right now, and so that's that's the series we're working on. But they love young Kirk and young Spock, love them. Well, they are young. Yeah, and they don't know what it's like to exist in a universe uh, in which you don't know Uhura's uh, first name. Like what? How yeah. is what is that? I don't know. Right. It's like watching Citizen Kane and knowing that Rosebud is the sled. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> uh, we should talk, to, talk, 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 talk <laughs> trailers, shouldn't we? Let's do well, trailers. Should we, should we do um, uh, some feedback first? Oh, I'm glad because we forgot last time. We had this yeah. whole thing. In plan. You, please, let's do feedback. I'm so glad so you're we, on we've this. Got, we've got a few uh, wonderful comments on iTunes and... We've got a, a nice comment on Flick Chart. We do? Yeah, we sure do. <laughs> so here, let me get started. First up from Zego, X-E-G-O. I guess it's Zego or X-E-G-O on iTunes. I just found your podcast on Stitcher, and I had to write to tell how impressed I was with your Night of the Hunter podcast. Really first rate. Looking over the list of episodes on iTunes, I felt like I struck podcast gold. You guys seem to have struck just the right balance between humorous camaraderie and well-researched insight on a great film. Oh, your podcast, yeah, that's nice. That's so. Your nice. podcast is the gold standard. Is that still good? In question, uh, in parentheses, question mark for podcasts, right up there with Sound on Site, the Projection Booth, and my all-time favorite, the Hollywood Saloon. Uh, a nice group of uh, podcasts to be associated oh, with. Oh, so, yes. So thank you very much. Well, now wait a minute. This was the uh, this is this this kind gentleman Exego also he wrote actually, us on Facebook, 
he wrote did. us a oh. message. He wrote that message and then said he was going to do that. But I, I have to say, because he's also been active on our Facebook page, so I don't feel like I'm giving anything away. But I have, uh, he happens to have possibly the coolest uh, name ever for this <laughs> for this business. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm just gonna read some names right now, and I want you to to see which one is which one is different. Are you ready? Go for it. Reed Richards. Sue Storm, Otto Octavius, Peter Parker. Right? Uh-huh. Are, you, are you ready? John uh-huh. Johnson. Right? <laughs> right? Yes, he's a super happy, hero. Like happy Hogan, Kurt Connors. They all like he's <laughs> a Marvel superhero. John Johnson. Did uh, you that must be- Ex ego, that must be his uh, superhero name. <laughs> it's right. We, <gasps> we've totally just ru- <laughs> we just ruined, ruined it. Sorry, his alter ego. <laughs> we'll cut this out. <laughs> That's right. We'll have to cut this out. That was it. It was very kind and extremely, uh, extremely uh, a fantastic naming convention. I yes. th- that made me so happy. I mean, I read that immediately. I thought this guy belongs in a comic. Somebody should yeah. make a comic with John Johnson. I'm sure, been... you know, because I'm also sure that we are the first people to ever mention this to John Johnson. There could have also been Peter Peters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> All right, next up. That makes I me... heard... <laughs> I'm so <laughs> sad. <laughs> next up, I heard 03. Great movie podcast. Andy and Pete have a solid professional competence when it comes to discussing movies, but without the snooty film school attitude you run into sometimes. They seem to have a lot of fun watching movies and doing this show, and their theme-based series idea are a nice differentiation from other podcasts. Check out the archive. It's great. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I love that that mention to check out the archive. Absolutely. It's, it's quite an archive. It's really We've- coming along. It's 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 at a point where you might say robust. You know, we haven't technically haven't missed a week. That feels great. Yes, yes. We should take a vacation. All right. What else do you have? Others? <laughs> uh, we do have one. Philip Heard on Facebook also said, "Just found your show recently on iTunes. Love it. So that's nice." Oh. And then jumping over to Flickchart, uh, G Job or J E Job. I found your podcast on iTunes and enjoy your film discussions. I had never heard of Flickchart before hearing it on your podcast. So thanks for promoting it. I now have all my films listed and I'm constantly ranking them. This site has changed how I compare films. I now look at which film I am more likely to pull off the shelf and watch. Thanks again for your enjoyable podcast. Oh, that's a double header. Mm-hmm. And, and totally uh, pimping the addictive factor of Flickchart. That's the truth. It that, really is. That is addictive. <laughs> <laughs> That is fantastic. Thank you to everybody who writes in these kind words. It is certainly motivating, and uh, for us to keep doing this this thing, and and um, uh, it's it's just great to hear that uh, people are out there. So thank you so much for for being a part of it. Make sure to jump over to uh, to uh, Facebook and keep up the conversation. Um, uh, shall we do some trailers? Let's do trailers. Let's talk. Let's talk about. We got some breaking news in this J.J. Abrams controversy mystery. Have you seen the breaking is, news? I, I haven't seen any breaking news. Oh, good. News. Then I'm breaking it to you. That's fantastic. You break, break the news on my head. Well, first of all, what is the, the uh, mystery? <sighs> the mystery is, what is it? Mm. It's this little teaser. We don't know if it's a movie, a TV show. I don't know. Well, you tra- tell me. The teaser, well, the teaser is that it, it's this guy, and he's like kind of come. I don't know. Is he walking out of the ocean or something? Or... Uh, um, yeah, it's kind of Inception esque. Yeah, yeah, very it's like much. He's and then washed upon the shore. And there's these, there's a sort of uh, Leonard Nimoy ish kind of voiceover, and uh, it's doing uh, saying some crazy stuff. And then it turns around, and and it turns out it's a guy with his uh, with his mouth sewn shut. Right. Oh, see, I thought that guy with the mouth his mouth sewn sewn shut was watching the guy who came out of the ocean as he stumbled away. Oh, I uh, didn't catch that. I thought it was the guy who turned around. I don't know. I anyway. Could be wrong. Well, here's what we just posed. This is breaking at the next reel on Facebook. That's how great our Facebook channel is. This is breaking. Yesterday, this is posted from uh, Vulture. 
uh, com yesterday. J.J. Abrams production company Bad Robot released a trailer called Stranger. While it was cool looking and intriguing, no one seemed to know what the trailer was for exactly. It didn't seem to fit anything on Bad Robot's film or TV dance card. The trailer is, parentheses, probably solved. It is for Abrams' book, The Ooh. First Clue to the Mystery of S, the new novel from J.J. Abrams and Doug Dorst, coming October 29th. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So that is a, uh, a, quote, very convincing argument for a stranger from Bleeding Cool. And uh, so uh, so that it, it, it may be a book. It's a, it it's a heck of a trailer. It's a heck of a trailer. But if, if it's a book, we can't ever talk about it again. That's right. It's off our list. <laughs> <laughs> Until he makes the movie version of it. Yes, then we can, right, talk, then about we can it. talk about it all we want. Yes. <laughs> Because we've never talked about books before. That's <laughs> unless it's been made into a movie. Let's do. What is your trailer tonight? I want to start with uh, start with yours. Start, start with mine. My trailer is going to be a dark and uh, probably pretty hard to watch film. It's the trailer for the new. Uh, I believe it was a Sundance film earlier this year, uh, festival film called Blue Caprice, uh, directed by Alexander Moore's. Starring Isaiah Washington, Tim Blake Nelson, Joy Lauren Adams, and Taquan Richmond um, as the younger of the two uh, people who perpetrated the uh, DC sniper attacks uh, a few years ago that really kind of uh, terrorized everybody and made you afraid to get gas. And the trailer looks like uh, it's basically based on the story of these two. And Isaiah Washington and Taquan Richmond look great in the parts. It looks like a really interesting psychological study of the nature of these killers and kind of how they came together and just the relationship between the two. And it's just this really kind of a horrifying relationship and leading to them doing some horrifying things. And I have to say, ever since that attack, I mean, I still always think about it when I'm getting gas. I always think about the sniper. And it's just amazing how it's kind of, you know, permeated my brain every time I'm at the pump now. That's and so interesting. I, yeah, it really, it's just, it's just one of those strange little things. I mean, it's not like I'm ducking or anything like that, but it's just, I instantly think of that. I instantly think of snipers. So uh, I, I'm quite excited to see this film. I think it's going to be a, a pretty powerful one. And I'm uh, with some terrifying performances you're an example of why kids should watch more sesame street <laughs> <laughs> it is horrifying focus on the good things yeah. people. <laughs> it is horrifying and uh you know i'm right with you the you know this was the um wasn't this the the um uh, this was the the what's his name that i like so much the tom cruise at um the reacher jack right. yeah this was a reacher this was kind of the reacher story right was it one of the Reacher from the Reacher novels? You mean, or from the, yeah, from the Reacher novels, right? Um, and so it's a it, it, it's a uh, sort of a similar. Uh, oh, you just mean you mean the actual movie with the sniper? Yeah, the movie okay. with the sniper. It's kind of, it, it's kind of like the sniper shooting into crowds, kind of a thing. Like there's a, yeah. and and that that's uh, that's one of those things that, that you know that gets me to. I don't think about it every time I'm getting gas, but it's it's one of those things that's on my mind. Like uh, you know, it's funny how that you're right, how that has uh, permeated the the conscious. Uh, the subconscious, cultural yep. subconsciousness of, right. uh, of us. But it looks really good. It's weird to see old uh, Dr. Burke as this uh, sort of a psychotic prophet, sociopathological prophet. Um, yeah, uh, you know, it looks like he plays it well. It looks like yeah. the sort of performance that you get, uh, you know, award buzz for. Yeah, yeah, no, it really does. It really yeah. does. Yeah. Uh, when is this coming out? It uh, comes out September 13th, so uh, just under a month. And then in iTunes later that week, uh, yeah. or s the September 17th, so or I guess the following week. So I'm loving these be releases, a, these iTunes releases. Quick, yeah, quick turnaround on that one. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that one. It uh, looks like a haunting film. So check that one out at uh, thenextreel.com. You'll find it on the episode page for this, uh, this film that we're talking about tonight, Miller's Crossing. So uh, my trailer is uh, uh, Fading Gigolo. This one's in honor of our movie tonight, in fact. Miller's movie. That's right. That's right. Uh, this is a new film. It's coming out in 2013. I don't I don't have a, a date. There is no date on... 
Well, yeah. it's it's uh, going to be opening, uh, premiering, I should say, at the Toronto Film Festival. Okay. Oh, in September. So yeah. All right. So September at Toronto Film. Sometime after that, it'll come. But it's probably it probably hit iTunes before it hits anywhere else. Because uh, that so seems, seems like the, the sort of trend that we're seeing with movies like this. Fading Gigolo is written and directed by John Turturro, uh, but uh, interestingly stars um, Woody Allen Yeah, in this John Turturro film, written and directed by John Turturro film. And those names, you watch this trailer and you think to yourself, this is a Woody Allen movie. That's what I thought. It think that? did have that. It it's had that, that vibe. vibe. Yeah, it really it's, did. It, this feels like John Turturro's written and directed a Woody Allen movie. This is a this this could be an homage uh, to Woody Allen starring Woody Allen, which is fascinating. Um, it is about uh, John Turturro plays a. Um, it looks like he's a florist of some sort, and he is talked into becoming a gigolo for older, uh, rich ladies. Uh, and uh, it is uh, it's a film about the uh, exploits and um, uh, all of the fun that goes on in this uh, kind of universe that they've set up here. It looks I, I, I have no idea where the film's going because it really just kind of is a, a nice little setup of the whole situation. I, I can't quite tell, you know, where are these characters going to go? What's their journey over the course of the film? But it looks like. A, a really interesting film, and I just from the trailer, I really enjoy these characters. I I think so too. And the uh, um, you know the people that they got in this film: Sofia Vergara, Liev Schreiber, uh, Sharon Stone, Vanessa Paradis. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, Michael Badalucho plays Burly Driver. Uh, I mean, it just looks uh, it looks like a fantastic, uh, funny cast. So I and and it, it looks very charming. So um, because it looks charming and funny, it'll probably be uh, quite a dud because of the curse. <laughs> uh, but it looks really good. So ch- again, check out that trailer on the uh, Miller's Crossing page for um, for this film at the next dot com. It'll only be a dud if we talk about it on the film board, which is a reminder we are doing a film board this weekend. Ah, uh, yes, curse of the film board. Yeah. Um, I yeah, I'm very excited about this one, and when I say that, I mean the opposite. <laughs> or should I say, <laughs> not only <laughs> the film we're doing on Saturday, or we're doing this on Saturday evening, we're recording the show will come out uh, on iTunes that evening or early the next morning. Uh, we are uh, we're doing your next, which is uh, I don't know, very scary. Looks very, very scary. scary. We're supposed to see it. On the big screen, and then talk about it. It's just, I I blame mostly you and Tom, <laughs> and I'm excited for you guys to be able to you know wear your little, little Our crown, hats. crowns of horror, awesome because you'll be so excited because it's so great, making me see it in the theater. That's great. <laughs> You're gonna love it. Says no one ever. Says no me. one ever. Right. That's right. All right. Uh, so that's it. That's our trailers. That's our uh, pitch for the film board this weekend. Be on the lookout for your next for the film board. And I think we've got, who do we, we're not missing anybody, right? So far, do we have everybody I chiming in? I have no idea. All right. May just, it may just be you and me and Tom. Yeah. And that, that would be enough. Because mm-hmm. it'll be you and Tom and me in a corner. <laughs> Crying. Crying. You'll have little whimpers. That's right. <laughs> Tonight's film, however. Uh, interested to hear your renewed viewing uh, take on this film. We are continuing our series on the drama of the Brothers Cohen. Uh, last week we did our Blood Simple uh, conversation, a good conversation there, and this week we're doing uh, Miller's Crossing. And we, when we say drama, we really mean non-comedy. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Because they, yeah, I don't know if I really call any of these dramas. Yeah, no. I, this is a film that I, I've fluctuated a lot on over the years. I, I've liked it, I've not liked it, I've liked it, I've not liked it. And I really wasn't sure what I was going to get out of it this time. But I watched it, and I liked it a lot more uh, watching it again this time. And I think that I... I think that I liked it more because I kind of stepped back from it as the nature of the crime film, kind of like the, you know, the 20s crime film that it's kind of, you know, fitting itself into that genre. Um, And I looked at it as more of a character piece and that happens to take place in a, you know, crime world. 
And I, I think I enjoyed it a lot more. I think I found a lot more uh, to like about it. And I really enjoyed the journey that, uh, that our protagonist, uh, Tommy, goes through. I love that you said it that way. I, and I agree with you. I mean, I, 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 I liked it more than I, I turned around in the f- first few minutes into it. You know, I'm, I find myself already getting mired in characters and vernacular and this web of double talk uh, that I, I always found myself sort of resenting about this movie. Mm-hmm. This is a very dense movie. Uh, it's not it, it, it's not easy, and, and I don't mean that in in terms of uh, you know uh, it's it's particularly horrific. It's not particularly violent. There are a few you know slightly shocking and intense scenes, but it's not a, one of those horrifically violent kind of films. But it is not easy in that it challenges you to keep up with the characters and relationships and more sort of uh, you know guys in hats with pencil thin mustaches uh, you know and thugs. And that, you know, you got to be on your toes watching this movie. And so I feel like I came to the same sort of, uh, the same sort of realization that you just described, that if you step back and you just let it wash over you, uh, I think your experience with it, at least for me, it was improved. Uh, well, and, and I, I think for me, it was really trying to understand Tom Reagan and what he's really trying to accomplish in this film. And I, you know, I yeah. think for me, it's it's always been a challenge because it's he's such a a quiet character who really is more about thought than he is about action, and he doesn't really let on what he's thinking. But you can tell he's always thinking and always kind of plotting, or just, or just, you know, he's kind of the. Uh, uh, you know, I, I guess initially he's kind of, you could almost say like the conciliary sort of character yeah. oh, sure. for Leo, right? Sure, sure. He, he's there to kind of give advice and talk. And so he's, that's why he's always thinking. And it's not until later that I think he shifts a little bit and, and has to be a little more active. But, but trying to pinpoint why he's making the decisions that he makes over the course of the film, I think is something that I've never really spent much time thinking about. And I think because of that, I never really enjoyed it as much because I, I wasn't, I, I don't know, I guess I just didn't give it as much thought as maybe I should have. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily true. And I think that's one of the, uh, uh, one of the challenges of this film is that it, it, they don't make it easy uh, on you to, to um, sort of fall in love with anybody. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's that's one of the, uh, the that's one of the sort of costs of the genre. You know, I mean, it's that sort of it's a it's a noir film, um, neo noir uh, <laughs> film. It, you know, nobody is really likable uh, in this film, and it, it you know by uh, uh, sort of by bent of destiny, you know, everybody is is uh, you know on the take. Um, but what we have, uh, what I think is interesting about how Tom Reagan's character plays out is, and particularly in the context of Cohen movies, is that, um, it, you know, it doesn't start out talking about kind of the the weakling, you know, the kind of Joe everyman struggling to to get a leg up. Uh, Tom Reagan is the conciliary of of Leo, the the political boss, right? I mean, he's he is second in command. He's the right hand man of leadership of crime, and um, and that puts him in an interesting position. This film, unlike others, is a film about somebody who's in a position of at least perceived power and we watch him or we are led to believe that he is on a, on a fall uh, versus, you know, other films where we see, you know, others trying to make good. He is, you know, we're watching him sort of break relationships everywhere he turns, which is kind of an interesting thing played by this sort of uh, soft-spoken, uh, you know, fantastically handsome, wonderfully accented Gabriel Byrne. He's someone you want to like, and yet everywhere he turns, he's he's sort of making this um, he's he's making things harder for people, kind of as they plays them against one another, and uh, for himself, and for himself, man, he because gets I, beaten I, up a lot. He does well, and I think he's an interesting character because the way he doesn't plan things out in a linear fashion, he seems to very much, you know, have a sense as to the cards that need to be played, and he just kind of plays them 
not necessarily in the right order. And so sometimes it seems like he's he's jumping ahead and making a decision or saying something that maybe he shouldn't have said at that particular moment. And uh, it just and and so it's interesting because I I think that forces him to kind of adjust his hand a bit. And you know, I I think um no, but I, I, and, yeah. I, and I think he's making those decisions, uh, you know, it seems to be kind of based on his uh, emotions, but only in the sense that really watching this film this time, it really seems to me that it's all about Leo and every decision that he ends up making. And when you get to the end of the film and you see, it's really all about keeping Leo in power initially. And then once Leo makes bad decisions and gets knocked out of power, then he does everything in his power that he can do to get Leo back into power. That's exactly right. That that is exactly my take on it too. And I, you know, you use the word linear, and I think that's that 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 works with how I visualize the the flow of this movie. When you look at all the other characters on sort of a linear path, right? They all sort of are are moving in a, in the same direction. I imagine them coming out like a spider web, you know, moving in toward the center. And and it's Tom Reagan's character is on sort of a spiral around, sort of intersecting with all of their individual paths, right? Mm -hmm. And it, if you start Start at the end, uh, the conversation that Leo and Tom are having at the funeral uh, as they're walking together and, and you realize that they understand one another now, uh, it, it, that's the point where it all starts to, to make sense. That every decision that he made on this circular path through the narrative, that Tom Reagan made on this circular path through the narrative, it all leads back to center, to, as you say, to Leo. He's sort of the sun in this solar system, and if you can, if you can track all the, the uh, you know, the other bodies that want him, you know, somehow gone, uh, then you can, you can follow that path back to Leo. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's really interesting at the end, when, it, it, when that conversation happens between Tom and Leo, and, uh, you know, it, it's right out there that Leo is now going to marry Verna. And, and that Verna asked him. Yeah, and there, but there's, that, there's still that sense of betrayal from Tom. It, it, I, it's almost like this whole thing was like, I did all, I can see like the subtext being, I did all this for you. I, I did it to prove that, that, you know, you shouldn't have sided with Bernie and that we should have killed him to, to prevent this whole thing in the first place, that Verna was only sleeping with you because uh, she was trying to protect her brother. Uh, and, you know, now she's only wanting to marry you because uh, to get back at me. And you're still going to go along with that. So I did all this for you. Take it because you're the right man for the job, but I'll have nothing more to do with you. Right. Right. That's his little sub subtextual breakup speech at the end when he's looking under his hat. Uh, yeah, that's exactly that. That's exactly how I how I rationalize that too. Yeah. Um, and, and so you know, I mean, what we just described is it, it's a lot of work to pull that out, right? I mean, it's multiple viewings. It's you know, this isn't an easy movie. It's not, and and not just because of the that the all the little vocabulary of the time and and of these people it's it it takes a little bit to get into that and just the uh there's a lot of just fast dialogue there's a lot of dialogue that requires you to really be paying attention the whole time so that you can get okay who is the dane what is his relationship with mink how is mink's relationship with uh bernie and you know just and then bernie and verna and all the relationships and how is everybody tied together and all these strings going across everything and it really does require multiple viewings to really start pinpointing okay bernie is is, is moving in on casper's territory or not moving in on it but he's using information that casper was giving to him to his own advantage you know as a grifter and and casper wants him off and just you start piecing all of this together and going okay and i can see how that's you know, related to this, and that's related to that, and this is who killed Rug, and you get all of this this stuff, but it does take a little while because it's not spelled out, uh, you know, like a a kindergarten uh, alphabet. It's it's a little trickier than that. Kindergarten alphabet. Are you calling me a simpleton? <laughs> no, but that would be like an Adam Sandler film. <laughs> 
it, it's all spelled out there. It's like all right out alphabet. there. Well, that's the truth. But I think it 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 you know underlies the the fact that this movie did not do well when it was released, <laughs> right? It really didn't do well. This was a film that you know, the Coens again. They're just kind of a uh, they make such quirky films that it's it really is kind of hit or miss with with their audiences. Yeah. So, you know, that said, you have you said whether you liked it more now or less? I did. I liked it. You liked it more. I think I I, uh, see this is what I'm torn on because you 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 look at these elements. Right. I've already said I I love Gabriel Byrne. He's I, I, I what was the do you remember the first film you saw Gabriel Byrne Gabriel Byrne in the 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 first one? I think it was this. It was? I think so. Oh. Wow. Well, he's been in a lot of stuff. He has. He had been in a lot of uh a lot of stuff in the uh in the 80s and you know, I mean, I didn't see it like I've seen Excalibur. I, uh, but I didn't see it until much later. So I don't think I saw any of his anything of his until until this. Well, you know, I like movies like uh, like Stigmata. I was a big fan of, and um, uh, what was yeah, it? but that was that was much that later. was in the ni- late nineties. What was the what was the see? Now I'm forgetting the name of it. It was the one that was half animated with uh, Hollywood. You know, uh, the uh, is that cool. Cool, cool world. world, cool world. That was the first. He played Jack Deebs in Cool World, yeah. and I, uh, with uh, this was with him, and uh, this was Brad Pitt, right? When he had high hair, uh, and That's so this right. is the first time That's I right. saw Gabriel Byrne, and I, I sort of, he was one of those. Uh, That's right, it was Ralph Bakshi. That's why I liked it so much. Uh, <laughs> I was in my Bakshi days. Um, the uh, so I, uh, you know, I really. I had an early affinity for Gabriel Byrne and just really kind of started celebrating whenever he he came out with something. So I really like him in this movie. Uh, I love that soft-spoken approach that he has to to this character, uh, Tom Reagan. I uh, I think Marsha Gay Harden just nails the gun mall part of of Verna um, Birnbaum. I mean, I think she's uh, she's terrific as as uh, she is you know sleeping around mob bosses. Uh, I think John Turturro. As Bernie Birnbaum, this is to date his best work, um, and, and I'm also a big fan of uh, the film we'll be doing next week. With um, yeah, mm-hmm. not to spoil that one. So I'm I you know at John Polito, forget it. Is Johnny Caspar is fantastic. J. E. Freeman is Eddie Dane. I mean, every one of these. And, oh, please, Albert Finney. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you know, every one of these characters I am enamored with when they are on stage. And yet, at the end of this viewing this film, I find myself just exhausted, and not necessarily in a great way. <laughs> just like I had to work too hard to keep up with that with that film, even after seeing it a number of times. Um, so, no, uh, it's it's true. It's it's a hard film to watch. Yeah, uh, I and and from what I gather, the production of this film was was difficult. That uh, that the the uh, the brothers themselves had uh, you know dealt with significant bouts of writer's block to. Uh, uh, to kind of get through it as complex as it was. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'd call that production problems, but you know, definitely development problems. Right. As they were trying to put the story together, they uh, trying to deal with the complexity of the script. They hit a point where they just uh, couldn't figure out how to move forward, and so took a break, wrote Barton Fink, and then they came back to finish this one. Yeah, I'll see you spoil it, Barton Fink. That was obviously an easier movie to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting uh, that it's actually a movie about writer's block. Oh, I, I'm sure that's what gave <laughs> them the a idea. Bit of a part uh, in it. Uh, oh, so man. anyway, that's where I stand in this movie. So what I've m- m- talked a lot about Gabriel Byrne. Do you have anything else to add about Gabriel Byrne and what you, um, how, you know, see if yeah, you like I, him more than I do? I, I just really like him. I think he really hits the mark well for this character who really has to think. And, you know, it's, you know speaking of uh, Gabriel Byrne, I think we should also mention his hat and how predominant it, uh, a role it plays in the film. And really it's all about kind of, you know, keeping his head and, and you know, staying cool. And, and it's always these, these situations that he gets himself into where he loses his hat and then he has to get it. And it's funny because he's always chasing his hat, but then he is the one who also is talking about this dream that he had about 
his hat, it, how it blew off in a forest and it was blowing away. And, and she, you know, said, oh, well, then you chased after it and got it and it turned into something beautiful. He said, no, it's foolish for a man to follow or to chase after his hat. And here he is always chasing, always after his chasing hat. his hat. But it's interesting because it really does kind of, it's almost like his hat represents his head and, you know, keeping his head because in a way his character is really all about his head versus his heart. And he's got this, um, this, uh, well, and I, way, I would add way, his head versus Leo's heart. Well, yeah. And, uh, but it's, it's really kind of like, he's got to keep his head. He's got to stay in the game. It's when he, you know, takes his hat off, you know, he ends up, you know, sleeping with Verna and stuff like that. Um, which he clearly is just doing, it seems to me that uh, now after wa- re-watching it and really kind of clicking with him a little more, it seems that he's really just kind of sleeping with her, really just purely for physical pleasure. There's nothing, I mean, just the way he talks to her, it's clear there's not a lot of, of uh, emotional attraction to her. It, I think all of his emotional attraction um, is really falls in the, in the uh, loyalty to his boss, to Leo. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there's any actual love for Verna. In fact, I kind of asked myself, is he really only sleeping with her to keep an eye on her for Leo? You know, you start asking yourself questions like that as you realize that, you know, there's not that love there and, and what he's doing for Leo. No, and it's because, and, and I, would, I, would, uh, I would second that, and I would uh, raise you that he is, uh, he, he is in love with Leo at that level, right? I mean, this is, he will, I, I think his relationship with Verna is uh, evidence that he will do anything uh, to help his, you know, his boss. Yeah. And, and when you, I, so when you phrase that speech at the funeral uh, as a breakup speech, uh, I don't, I, I, I think that was precisely on the mark, right? I mean, well, and that's, and that's in, that's re- referencing what is, uh, possibly the only gangster film I know of that actually has homosexual characters that nobody makes any sort of deal out of. It's just the fact that there they are there are some that are homosexual, and it's such a strange thing to kind of catch on to and go, oh, that's interesting. The Dane and Mink, they're a homosexual couple, and then the Dane finds out that Bernie is is kind of moving in on Mink and has been sleeping over at his place. And all of a sudden, there's a whole interesting dynamic going on with those three outside of the other dynamic of the actual, the working, uh, the, you know, the gangster working dynamic that is going on with those three. Now there's all this, this homosexual love triangle. And then you take that and you step back and you look at Tommy and Leo. Now, I don't know if Tommy's love for Leo actually goes in the homosexual vein, but it certainly no, could. Yeah. Well, it could, it, and it, I, but I didn't, uh, that's not how I uh, perceived it, but, it, you know, I was more talking about that there, um, uh, you know, the, a, even a, uh, I, I don't know, it's just, just sort of that deeper kind of um, brotherly, sort of familial love. Absolutely. Um, that that I think, you know, and that, and that fatherly love, I think that affinity that, that Leo has for, you know, certainly younger uh, Tom, mm-hmm. and and it, it goes to why that betrayal in the middle of the film was so grand. You know, as he comes, uh, that one of the the this movie is full of really beautifully vivid sequences, and and for me, right at the top is uh, the betrayal of uh, Leo by Tom as Tom is walking down the hall, which is just filled with you know people, and uh, long in the distance at the end of the hall, storms the silent. Leo, and he comes down the hall and, and uh, you know, just beats the tar out of Tom, throws him down the stairs. That is a wonderful, uh, vivid uh, visual sequence that is, you know, made so much more powerful by the fact that they are, you know, they have this kind of familial attachment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought well I, you were said. supposed to follow up with that with film leaves. <laughs> film leaves. Well, I, I'll get to that, but... Going back to the heart, the other thing that I think is interesting is just looking at how Tommy's heart kind of betrays him. And, and going ba- again back to the decisions and how he was not necessarily making decisions in a linear order. When he is sent the assignment to actually take Bernie out to Miller's Crossing and kill him, um, he 
in his moment of letting his heart rule rather than his head, looking at all of his puzzle pieces, he said he sees that, you know, I don't have to kill Bernie in order for all of this to still work. As long as Bernie leaves and doesn't show up again, then I'll be fine. And so he... In succumbs. hindsight, that turns out to be kind of dumb. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. So, yeah, because he succumbs to his heart. He doesn't kill him. And, of course, then he finally later has to actually get rid of his heart and uh, actually kill Bernie. Yeah. You know, so it's, it was it's a funny. That's a funny game that he played, right? To and and it's if you think back to Blood Simple, it's the same trick uh, that our friend the assassin uh, thought through, right? I don't have to have killed these people in order to get this money. Yeah, right. The Blood I'm, Simple. Right. The Blood I'll just Simple. Doctor twist. these photos. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, you know, here I don't have to uh, let. I don't have to kill. Bernie, in order to let this play out the way I think it needs to play out. And in both cases, they ended up being uh, mistaken. Yeah. What is it that the Coens are saying about that? I think there's some just, bro- just brotherly angst. Just followed through the first time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so... But, but go going back to the yeah. hat in the lead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I were... posted this thing, and yeah. I was being sarcastic... <laughs> and you went and answered me, and uh, there I am, the dope on Twitter with the, <laughs> with the film leaves, Andy with the heavy leaves. My question was, there's this sequence in the very beginning, the, t- the t- opening sequence, where the hat falls on the ground and then blows away in this listless kind of slow motion. It's a heavy hat. These felt hats were not light hats. And you think about the, the size of the fan and the power of the fan required to blow this hat away. My initial thought was, how would you like to be the guy who has to nail down the leaves? Right? <laughs> right? And I'm just sort of thinking like that. So I write this on Twitter, you know, how do they get those leaves not to blow away? It's like four leaves pick up and blow away. And this jet turbine of a fan is blowing this hat down the thing. And Andy responds to me with the truth and the reality that, well, they're film leaves. They're, I don't know what you said, they're probably they're very heavy. Specially trained leaves Spe- do not blow unless, the, <laughs> unless they're told. They're well trained. Uh, that was funny. Oh, yes. That was but good in, times. But in fact, what actually happened with the hat blowing across it they shot it at high speed so it has that kind of nice slow blow right. as the as the hat blows it that happened to be a special lightweight hat that they had designed <gasps> and they controlled it with fishing line there was no wind oh now i'm double trumped <laughs> <laughs> uh lightweight hat god I never saw that coming Although you wish it was trained leaves, I know. <laughs> now I do, or very heavy ones, or uh, that there was actually a leaf nailer. It makes me want to go watch the credits <laughs> for the leaf nailer. Who was that leaf nailer? Uh, so that is, that's fantastic. That's a good, good story about the hat. Yes. It's a good hat. And I'm, I think that, that whole tale, I think, you know, adding the element of the hat uh, as a symbol of his, you know, his, his more mechanical kind of logical nature is, uh, is, is a, you know, it makes Gabriel Byrne's performance that much better. He's, he just really, I think he's just fantastic there. Uh, well, like, apparently, apparently he asked the, uh, the Coen brothers at one point, um, this is, I don't know if this is uh, truth or one of those set rumors that floats around, but apparently he asked them about the hat and said, what does this hat represent? Why, you know, why all this about the hat? And they just kind of gave each other a look, a knowing look, and just kind of snickered and, and walked off or something like that. And so Gabriel Byrne said, you know, at that point, I decided I was not going to work with these guys again. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes actors do like to get, you know, some a direction. To get, get in on, on yeah, the, uh, in the on whole the point joke. or something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. T- uh, talk to me about John Turturro. You know, you said that this was uh, possibly his greatest performance uh, thus far. I mean, this is a man who has quite the film career, stage career. I mean, he's a he's a fantastic actor. I don't know. I'm hard pressed to say if it's his greatest performance, but this is definitely a powerhouse performance in this film. Transformers may trumpet. I knew you were going to say oh, that. Oh, you knew I, I was knew going you there. were going to lower the bar. <laughs> But, oh, but you know, his his uh, you know his filmography is is not short. 
he has he's done some some really great stuff. Uh, yeah. From Miller's car. I mean, you know, look at his the '90s for John Turturro were great. Yeah. Uh, uh, Barton Fink, Jungle Fever, uh, Fearless, uh, Being Human, Quiz Show. Oh God, Quiz Show! I take it back. I think Quiz Show was his greatest performance. Man, there's there's a, sh- a movie we need to talk about. We How really does... do. How is that one kept slipping? Oh, I don't know. Man, we'll do, a, we'll do a Redford directing series. That's what. That's how we're gonna do it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, anyway, it just one after another, uh, Turturro, and he's such an, uh, a sort of uh, strange kind of an actor, and, and I think that's what makes him, uh, that, uh, for me, that's what makes him so compelling, because uh, every nuance, uh, every, you know, sort of tick on his face, um, you know, every, every lisp that comes out of his mouth, I find a surprise. Right, I mean that's the that's the thing that makes him, I think, such an interesting actor is because he is, I think, gifted with this sort of physical awkwardness that makes every performance unique. Yeah, even I mean, Transformers. He, yeah, he's he's kind of born to be a great uh, character actor. Yeah, he's got the look. He's got kind of just a quirky personality. That's why he works well as supporting characters or as character actors. And uh, you know, I I think that he's always somebody who's interesting to watch. He just he brings a lot to the table, right. and I I absolutely enjoy watching him in uh, every performance. And I love the way that he plays this grifter character. And you see this emotional plea that he gives to Tommy when they're out at Miller's Crossing, and you know you feel it. Your heart is just breaking for him and everything. And then you see him delivering like the same. Now you realize performance to Tommy when they're up at uh, Tommy's apartment right. and you realize that you know this is a guy who's just you know he is a grifter he fakes it he doesn't really feel these emotions i mean sure he didn't want to die but i mean it was all just an act to to get uh, to find Tommy's weak side and to you know as he said look into his heart it's just a, it's a very interesting way to play this character i really enjoyed that about him yeah yeah no i absolutely agree he's he's wonderful um, there are some sequences in here, and I don't know why this, I, the, the, largely unrelated, but there are sequences in here that I was thinking about you specifically. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the, the, uh, you know, Tommy's about to get beat up, right? He's in there yeah. in the warehouse and the great big guy, uh, there's, it's this long sequence of them sort of pacing back and forth. He goes over to the wall and he takes off his jacket. And he, you know, we see him, this sort of no cuts, walks over there, goes back to Tom, back to him. He's, he takes off his jacket, he hangs it up and he walks over and Tommy stands up slowly. He takes off his jacket, says, just a minute. And as he says, just a minute, he picks up a chair and hauls off and hits the guy in the face. And mm-hmm. the guy says, oh, geez, Tommy. <laughs> and then he walks away and goes and gets more guys. Right. And what I'm thinking there is that made you think of me. <laughs> yes, you know why? This is gonna this is gonna bake your noodle because I thought this is a sequence that Luc Besson would have delivered. <laughs> I didn't think that. I don't know why. Maybe it's the Coens, and I, I find their humor more logical <laughs> I, than crazy crazy Frenchman humor. I think that there are a number of sequences in here that fall in, under that Luc Besson could have directed this film, and I'm surprised that Andy <laughs> let this go. That's funny. Uh, well, I think you're wrong. Jesus, Tom. <laughs> that, of course, was Mike Starr, the wonderful yes. supporting actor yeah. who uh, always does great as a, a kind of a big thug. One of my favorite performances of his was in uh, Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> Fun that to watch. Was great. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, and we should mention there's a brief little uh, uncredited cameo of. Sam Raimi in this film. Sam Raimi. He plays the uh, the gunman when they're outside of uh, the um, the bar. All the cops are are waiting and they they throw in kind of a, a smoke bomb. Yeah. As the gangsters start coming out, one of them comes out kind of bloody and and he shoots him and starts laughing about it before the gangsters all start shooting in big war. That's Sam Raimi. Indeed, a young Sam Raimi. Yeah, he, uh, he he's buddy very, buddy with these very guys. Very young, very young looking, young mm-hmm. young lad. Speaking of young lads, here's a footnote. Uh, 
Do you see the picture that uh, the, of the the delicately colorized chaplain? I did. That was beautiful work. Check I out know, the isn't it? Facebook page for that. That was unreal. That was he's he could have been hanging out with us. He totally looks just like some some guy that I teach in film school. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, that's uh, what, are we, we want to talk about more characters before we jump into Barry Sonnenfeld. Uh, you know, I think we're going to uh, talk about Albert Finney. Should, Albert Finney uh, is always fantastic. Uh, he stepped in uh, two days before the film started shooting because, unfortunately, the the uh, wonderful actor that they had cast for the role uh, Trey was a Trey Wilson, right? Um, he was Nathan Arizona in Raising Arizona, and we've talked about him before in Bull Durham. He was cast as Leo, but two days before uh, the film uh, principal t- photography started, he died from a brain hemorrhage. So uh, absolute tragedy there. But, um, you know, I think it was a great find with Albert Finney. And uh, Albert Finney reportedly had so much fun making this movie. He loved this world that he actually stuck around to, fil- to be in the very last scene shot which happened to be the scene in the ladies' bathroom, you know, their powder room, when, uh, when Tommy storms in to have his little chat with Verna, and he, he kicks all the women out. He, Albert Finney wanted to be, in the, uh, be there so badly that he actually dressed in drag as a maid, and you can see him in the background as one of the women who gets up and runs out when Tommy comes in. <laughs> You know what? I did not know that, and I didn't catch it. I I've, didn't either. I, I only caught it because it was uh, they talk about it on some of the uh, the behind the scenes. That's fantastic. Yeah, I need to check that out. There, uh, you know, there was another uh, casting switch that I thought was very interesting. This is of the Dane. Yeah. Um, the part of the Dane was originally uh, to be played by Peter Stormare. Uh, another Cohen brother regular. Uh, another Cohen brother brother. Cohen Brugger regular. Uh, he's uh, he's been a, in a ton of stuff, but you'll remember it from not too long ago when I was going through my prison break phase. Mm. Uh, he was uh, John Abruzzi in Prison Break, and that's uh, there. There was some of that that was a very good show, but mostly, you know, he was in uh, Big Lebowski and Fargo. And uh, anyway, we'll be talking more about him. So that was an interesting switch. He was uh, he he the the character was supposed to be called the Swede. Um, um, and uh, since it was the character was changed, it was rewritten for uh, uh, and, and recast as the Dane, uh, Eddie Dane, the ferocious gay hitman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that was uh, so that's uh, uh, Albert Finney. He's spry. Do you see how spry he was when that house when his house lit on fire and he had to jump he- out the window? He flies out that window. Man, and, he and hauls out that window. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great scene. It's it's a lot of fun to watch. It's really well executed. Uh, it's a surprise know. because you expect the the senior guy to be hit, right? I mean, yeah, right. This is what happens. That the, the there is a changing of the guard, a changing of the power structure in these films, and they turn it on its ear by letting Albert Finney, letting Leo be spry and be the you know top of the heap, and he jumps out the window and he he watches his house burn as he's as he's um, mowing it down with a Tommy gun. Well, and it's it's interesting because you know the Coen brothers really in a way, are kind of like they, they did in Blood Simple. They're acknowledging these uh, elements of, within the genre. And, you know, with the gangster and the, and the mob genre, you know, I mean, you look at something and how it's set up like The Godfather with all these hits and how these people come in and just, you know, just kill everybody at the end of The Godfather. And, and you set that up here where you see them kill his bodyguard. And then he, like you said, he just totally takes them. It's a it's a really interesting way that the Coen brothers play with convention in their films, and I think that it works uh, in their benefit. But I think it's also one of the things that some people who really like their genre films, it may be one of the things that that set people off with the Coen brothers and makes it harder to enjoy. Yeah, I think so too. I think that's a that's another thing that sort of makes it um, you you go in expecting something of the promises of the genre and they they sometimes turn those right on their ears. Um, in in this case, for me, that's what makes it work. Even in in um, in spite of 
the more challenging aspects of the the story and the script itself. Yeah, that's what that's what makes it work. Um, let's see, um, who's next on the list? Um, just two last little casting notes. Steve Buscemi briefly has an appearance as a very fast talking mink. And uh, Frances McDormand has an uncredited cameo as the mayor's secretary, who by this time was, uh, was a, uh, married to Joel Cohen. Both of those are interesting. I think Steve Buscemi's is, a, is, is the one that, that lends to the challenge of the film because Mink is a character that is talked about a lot, mm-hmm. but only seen a little. Yeah. Um, I, I think for, particularly for first-time viewings, this film is... Um, that ends up being a case of mistaken identity that is uh, lost on the viewer. Yeah. Um, to me, that's a, that's a shortcoming of the, of the way they play that twist. Yeah, but it, but at least it's a name that you recognize, and uh, it's like it's not easy to confuse that name with a different character. Right, Mink it stands out, and Steve Buscemi plays that character in his one scene really well. This is a real fast talker, uh, you know, he stands out for me, and I I really enjoy his performance. But you're right, it is a shortcoming when you know they keep talking about the Mink, the Mink, the Mink, and and all this stuff, and you, you want to go, gosh, I wish that. There was more with the mink, so I could remember more about who he was. <laughs> yeah, right. It, you know, because the next time we see him, he has no face. Right. Right. His face is gone, and he's at Miller's Crossing. So uh, that ends up being a challenge. And you know, I want to go back to the Luc Besson point that I made. You got that where I was thinking of you. There was another one that I let slip, and I didn't want to let. The, I'm, I'm watching the movie right now, and it the Albert Finney escape from the mansion scene just happened and he jumps off the thing he picks up his tommy gun and he turns around and he sees the the gunsel in the window and he turns around and he starts shooting and it is the longest most comical uh, assassination by machine gun uh, that i have ever seen and needs to be in a luc besson film but he just keeps shooting and the guy does he never falls down he just keeps kind of dancing as he's getting riddled with bullets and then it does a close-up on the chandelier which is now spinning back to him dancing as he's riddled with bullets and firing himself and it is uh it's another scene that made me think this is this is andy andy should probably love this because it's luke besson but it's it's the comedy stylings of the coen brothers and there are they're very far apart from luke besson in my mind Uh, well that is or maybe they just know how they just know how to use comedy better than he does (laughs) Uh, okay no, I'm going to keep coming up with these. Um, yeah, I know. So, uh, uh, all right. Yeah, briefly, John Polito is Johnny Caspar. Uh, he's uh, kind of a, a regular in these Coen Brothers films, and he's, God, he's just so fun to watch. He is just a riveting character actor that really bites into a role and just becomes this character that is just, I mean, he's just so... Uh, dark and funny and uh, honorable. You know, there's it's just such an interesting set of things going on with him that seem kind of anachronistic, but they all kind of make sense. Well, they're him. so annoying. It, it's it's that you, you know, I think what's so kind of fun about his character is that he goes on and on about ethics. First mm. of all, the sort of irony of the fact that he's talking about ethics in a business where there is no good. Right. There's only relativism. Uh, mm-hmm. But second, that he's so annoying uh, <laughs> that there's just no one you want to hear a, a sort of monologue about ethics from uh, sort of worse than than uh, this character who's just just cr- uh, he's corruptly annoying. Like he's like so far off the spectrum of, of annoying. And yet he is the, uh, is ascending to power. And that, that's, uh, that, that to me is a better demonstration of the Coen brothers sense of comedy than the slapstick stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it's the, the choices they make with these really ironic characters. I think that are, that, that I find humorous. Yeah. He's he's he is a really interesting character. I, you know, speaking a little bit of his uh, of this world and and what he has to say, I do find it really interesting that that he's the one who says it, and he does seem to in this dark world where you said it's you know there is no good, it's just just relativism. 
in a way, it's, it's kind of like the in The Godfather, going back to that. It's, it's like they have their own set of ethics and guidelines that they follow. And he seems to kind of follow these. And Leo seems to kind of have forgotten them because he's taken by a dame. And I, I find it really interesting that, that he, in, in a weird way, is kind of the, the grounded point in this. Because he certainly doesn't seem very grounded. Yeah, but, no, he really doesn't. I mean, he kicks the mayor out of his office. He's, I mean, he just, he's nuts. Smacks his son. Smacks his son and then hugs him and says, Oh, are you okay? Did somebody <laughs> hit you? <laughs> he's just diabolical. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. But, but fantastic. He's, uh, yeah, yeah, he's great. And it's, it's, it's fun to see that. And uh, that speech at the beginning of the film, I do think, sets you up for the world that we're in. This this yeah. morally corrupt yet run by its own set of ethics and morals. Well, and visually, that opening sequence is is I think uh, you know important too. That that when it opens, you know, it opens on ice, and then sort of there's that slow tilt up to uh, to Polito's character, and you see in the background that's where we meet both Polito, right? Who is as you know, as you say, is uh, becomes the grounded sort of character in this film, and deep in the background, uh, lost in depth of field, uh, is Tom uh, leaning up against the wall, and and to me that frame is important in setting up the dynamic of the film, kind of the emotional dynamic of the film. That one frame, I think, you when you look back at that at the end of the film, um, it, it, uh, it, it means more, right? This sense of we have uh, the, the ethical baseline of the film and we have the, the ultimate machinations of, of uh, uh, you know, of, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say sort of wrongdoing, but the, you know, the sense of, of you know Tom taking ownership of the story, uh, both on the same, on the same picture. This is a gorgeous film to look at, and it's interesting seeing how Barry Sonnenfeld's career as a cinematographer has shifted um, as he's moved through, uh, you know, from his first feature film, Blood Simple, to what is now he let's see this is one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is his eighth, and then Misery is the only other one he does after this. It's it's an interesting uh, career that he's uh, made as a cinematographer, and I think this film really stands out as somebody who's kind of come into his own and and has gotten to a place where he doesn't necessarily have to be quite as showy. And he's able to really just use the the tools of the camera to do the work for him. I really enjoy looking at this film. Um, I mean, I really enjoy looking at all all of his films. But you know, there's a difference that I think that he uses his his wide lenses, uh, and he's talked about this before, where he he'll use his wide lenses in the in the funnier comedy things because he finds that the wide lenses really bring out the humor, and. Uh, uh, the, at least the way he uses it. But when uh, making this film, he really used the long lenses because it creates a much handsomer look. You get that better depth of field. Yeah, and, and uh, boy, he plays that a lot in this film. A lot. Uh, not the least of which in the forest, yet at Miller's Crossing, right? The, I, I really love the way um, he sort of animates Miller's Crossing, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I don't know, you, you can talk more about this. I, my understanding is that he, he had recommended that they always shoot Miller's Crossing on cloudy days. Have you heard about this? Right, exactly. Why, he, well, tell me why that would be an important thing. He, he needed it to have a, a really muted look. He felt that this is, this is the place where, you know, kind of in the film, it's the place of executions. It's where they always come. And he really wanted it to have a muted look. He wanted everything to be softer, uh, a little more uh, toned down, a little blacker. And so he, and I, I'm not sure if, it, if he had scouted it on sunny and cloudy days, but he decided, you know, we have to shoot this on overcast days. And he actually lucked out because the Coens told him, they're like, you know, that's, that's great and all, but once we start shooting out there, we're not going to stop. We have to stick with the schedule. 
and uh, if it's if it's sunny, if it's cloudy, you know, we got to go anyway. Luckily, they got out there, and it was it was overcast for the entire time, except for one shot, like the very last shot. And it's it's I think right after he's thrown up, and you see him laying on the ground, and in the background you do see a couple. Um, you know, hits of sunlight on some distant uh, ground in the back. Right. But otherwise, it's virtually, it's overcast the entire time. And he also said, you know, I think they shot this film on Kodak film. He decided he wanted to shoot all of the scenes at Miller's Crossing, um, just the scenes on Miller Cro- at Miller's Crossing, on Fuji film because their green is much softer and bluer than Kodak's. He really wanted to use that as another way to bring down the color temperature uh, out at Miller's Crossing. Well, and that was what I was going to say. I find that interesting that the uh, it really does have this sort of bluish hue to it, right? And and uh, so two points on that. First, I love that he wasn't uh, he he was not only not afraid of, but attracted to white sky, right? These blown out highlights. Uh, you know, they they do this wonderful kind of walking pan of or, of you know shooting straight up into the into the canopy of these you know these leafless trees and the it it's almost sort of like they didn't defringe it right I mean it's just these blown yeah. out high contrast whites uh, to to the point where you can't even see the edges of the tree branches that are reaching into each other it's just really haunting um, and that the whole you know every time we go to Miller's Crossing it's it it is that sort of blue muted look and yet what's you know then the uh, all, all of the promotional artwork is completely sepia out and very very warm and yellow and and, uh, yeah, it's kind of strange. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting contrast. But um, so, you know, that was an interesting thing for me. When you look at all the promotional material, sort of the, the gateway material that gets you into the film, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it's sort of aged and um, uh, a period, right? Uh, you get that sort of sepia, kind of rough, very noisy, uh, grainy kind of images. And then you see the film and it's, beautifully clean they don't do any sort of uh, uh post trickery to make it look like you're looking at a film of uh, uh, you know f- sort of period um yeah. you know none of the tricks like uh you know even in the montage sequence of butch cassidy i mean none of the uh, none of the sort of aged tricks and i you know for me i really like that i'm i i you know I, i'm on the record of as um you know not really being a huge fan of the uh um you know of the noising up the the film to make it look old right right uh but i you know i really like how pure he's a purist in this film i think yeah absolutely and i think he he is smartly takes a step back and creates a film as the cohen said a a handsome movie about men in hats (laughs) yes yeah (laughs) yes it is that is what it is yes all right do you have anything? Did we do everything on your list? I think so. I'm just checking here. Well, yeah. we've we've already alluded to. Oh, uh, oh. Well, okay. I, I I keep forgetting. I forgot on Blood Simple. Um, Carter Burwell is the uh, started composing music with the Coen Brothers, and he's been he's done every one of their films, and really I. He's not always my favorite composer, but when he's working with the Coens, I think he really strikes a chord uh, with them and finds the right tones for their film. And I really enjoy the soundtracks to both Blood Simple and Miller's Crossing. And the theme that he came up with for this is just this beautiful kind of Irish uh, theme. And it's, it's, it really is is haunting and uh kind of heartbreaking romantic you know it's just it's this beautiful film score that he uh, that he came up with for this film yeah i think the music in general the use of danny boy in this film is always spot on the danny boy sort of theme yeah uh, yeah it, it's really beautiful music it just fits perfectly yeah absolutely um you know like blood simple this film was uh, in, heavily inspired by the works of dashiell hammett more so i think mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And so mentioning a couple of the books that this film uh, is, spins off of, uh, The Glass Key, 1931, uh, along with, uh, let's see, Red Harvest, 1929, uh, apparently Yojimbo and A Fistful of Dollars. Uh, there is a there is a, a hint of that of kind of Yojimbo in here, yeah. the way that he's kind of playing back and forth. But yeah. um, 
Yeah, I wasn't sure if that's just the nature of the story or if they were actually doing an homage to that. Well, I mean, I, you know, I, even if it's not necessarily a, a direct homage of, of Hammett's, these guys are clearly heavily influenced by these sort of hard-boiled uh, themes uh, from yeah. Hammett's work. So. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Movie did not do well in theaters. Do you have the numbers? Um, I, you know, I found that it cost about $14 million to make um, adjusted in adjusted dollars today, it'd be about $24.6 million. And it really did not make a lot of money. I see that it made um, about $5 million at the time, which is about uh, not quite $9 million adjusted. So they uh, definitely did not make money on this film in its initial release. Uh, adjusted profit per minute was a loss of $136,507.96 per finished minute. Movie has made but, uh, quite a comeback but, in. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You were you were going to say that's, that too. That's what I was going to say. Well, it's a cult favorite, the word right out of my mouth. You know, and and that gets to my next question. You can, I, I'm sure, because you're you, you have numbers to back this up. But my question for you is more of a, a, a in terms of the sentimentality of this film. How do you think this film is actually remembered in the catalog of Coen Brothers films? You know, again, speaking to the Coens, I, I think a lot of people go back and forth. I think you're going to have some people who are very much, I mean, just poking around on the Internet, I've found people who are just like, oh, this is my favorite film ever. This is one of the best gangster films ever, uh, who just sing its praises to no end. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have people who say, you know, this is just, uh, just uh, you know, cliche, uh, Coen Brothers, uh, typical stuff that they come up with. It's all this pretty stuff that that means nothing. It's again like a lot of their stuff. This is one of the films that stands out as a very, uh, uh, very much drawing the two different crowds. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Um, it, it is. It's funny, you know, when you look at the at, at when I look at the sort of the posters lined up. You know, I remember Miller's Crossing quite favorably, and and then you know, obviously, as I watch it, I I find all sorts of reasons to be exhausted by it. Um. So anyhow, all right. So you were, did you have numbers to go with the aftermarket release? No. Okay. All right. Those are a lot harder to find. Yeah, they're a lot harder to find unless they release them to specifically tout like how amazing something did uh, yeah. in the aftermarket. It's it generally those numbers don't surface very easily. All right. Well, we should probably rank this thing. Yeah, let's rank, right. rank it. If you want to follow along with our rankings, you can check out uh, flickchart.com slash the next reel. And that's where you will find uh, all of our films as we have have ranked them over the last couple of years uh and we invite you to follow us and share your own rankings and uh you know let's uh let's see how we do absolutely all right here we go miller's crossing or inside man inside man i think i would agree with you miller's crossing or the parallax view that's an interesting one yeah it is i was quite a fan of the parallax view they're both uh, very interesting films that challenging uh, that are challenging and uh, but enjoyable to watch, and both shot by stellar cinematographers. That's that is the trick. Uh, I think uh, I, I think I'm going to go with Pakula on this one. Yeah, I think Pakula I over the Coens. Yeah, Miller's Crossing or the Wolverine. <laughs> <laughs> Miller's Crossing. <laughs> totally. Miller's Crossing or We're No Angels? Miller's Crossing. Yeah. I mean, We're No Angels is a lot of fun to watch, but I think Miller's Crossing gives me a little more uh, mental satisfaction. Miller's Crossing or The Hobbit? An Unexpected Journey. Hmm. I, it, this, oh. this, this shouldn't be hard. I'm going to say Miller's Crossing. And I hope that when I watch the next Hobbit film, that maybe that will change. <laughs> Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. I'm going to say Miller's Crossing, too. All right. There you go. Uh, oh, well, this will... Miller's Crossing or Big Fish? <gasps> oh, God. I just swallowed my tongue. No. <laughs> uh, I'm going to say Big Fish. I knew you were. 
I knew you were. I, I feel like I need to go Miller's Crossing. <laughs> how, how much do you need to go Miller's Crossing? Uh, you know, I don't know. Albert Finney. Uh, I, you know, I'll go Big Fish because I love Albert Finney's character in Big Fish. Yes. How's that for you? Perfect. Big. All right. There you go. 81 out of 104. Huh. It feels low. It feels low, but we have 80 great movies ahead of it. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah, it's gonna start it, it, right when, when we hit two hundred. This is gonna. I'm gonna be really racked with guilt every week. <laughs> At one hundred, I'm not quite racked with guilt. At one hundred, I'm still on an on an effort to push Rush off our list completely. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, now, hey, nice, uh, nice run. Yeah, how's absolutely. Your, how's your stress sweat? Uh, you nice? know. The the fan has been blowing the stress sweat stink out of the room, so it's actually uh, I'm doing much better. <laughs> good, that's good. Yes, outstanding. This is a good film. I'm glad we did this film. What are we doing next week? Next week, uh, as you hinted, we're uh, we're gonna go watch Barton Fink. Barton Fink. Hello, Barton. I'm very curious to watch this one. I haven't seen it since it came out, and I didn't like it at all. So this is the one that really. Uh, I'm kind of more excited to watch this one again and see if if my uh, opinion about it has changed at all. You know, I I think this one is the I first of all I deeply enjoy this movie and uh, so that's um, I'm on the record whatever. Uh, but also I feel like this is a great uh, prep film for Inside Llewellyn uh, Davies Davis. Mm. Yeah, right? Davies Davies whatever. That first of all that looks like a great. Uh, trailer, but I think that uh, um, you know John. Th- this is a John Goodman prep film. Yeah, because at least judging by the trailer of Llewellyn Davies, his I, I think I'm going to really, really like his character in that film, as I really, <laughs> really like his character in Barton Fink. It'll be fun to watch. Mm. Mm. Hell in the this. hallway. Oh, I like this. <laughs> I like this movie. This is a quotable film right here. I'm not going to start, but I'm until next but, week. But I could. Yeah. Heil Hitler. <laughs> have you have you read the Bible, Pete? Holy Bible? Yeah, think so. Anyway, heard about it. <laughs> That's good. Looking forward to it. No, you're not. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. And some stinkers. Well, true. But you know, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. In season three, we covered even more great adaptations like The Night of the Hunter and It Happened One Night, both part of our Couples on the Run series. We talked about No Country for Old Men. The Coen brothers so rarely adapt someone else's work. We had some fun rom-com adaptations like About a Boy, based on the Nick Hornby novel, and Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, adapted from Rachel Cohn and David Levithan's book. In our terribly and naively named foreign language series, we discussed the brilliant City of God and the Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which I won't ever be able to watch again, ever. But could you read the original memoir? I don't know, maybe? We had our Richard Dysart series with adaptations like The Day of the Locust and Being There. Plus, we had that fantastic interview with the man himself. (laughs) The one where we had him sit on the floor? Because this chair was so squeaky. (laughs) Good times. We did our first Tom Hanks series with Forrest Gump adapted from Winston Groom's novel, plus Apollo 13 based on Lost Moon by Jim Lovell. And we did another year series looking at films from 1981, including Das Boot, Gallipoli, and Thief, all based on books. Listeners can dive deeper into all of these original stories and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, movie, video game. Video game. <laughs> you bet. We have talked about some video game adaptations as well. It doesn't matter the source, just follow the link. Every purchase supports the podcast. Check out the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and get reading, watching, performing, or playing today.